Okay, to, to conclude this section um, about how GBIF is um, helping to support biodiversity informatics, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the future plans for um, the Eva Nelson Prize, which we've seen Tony Rees uh, was the, the last winner of. So I want to introduce um, something that the Science Committee has come up with. I'm going to brief, very briefly run, this, run through this. There'll be um, uh, more material on this in the presentation tomorrow morning by the Science Committee Chair, I mean me. So perhaps some, some of the sort of specific questions about it might, might be best dealt with then. But I want to introduce this idea of the Debuff Challenge. What is a challenge? It's basically a, a task-specific competition where there are one or more prizes. So to give you a sense of, of how this differs from other kinds of ways of doing things, one approach to sort of uh, getting people to do things is to offer a prize. And Tony is a, is a great example of that. One thing about a prize is you give it a pot of money, and I guess you could ask a sort of fairly mercenary kind of question, what do you get back from the money? Now, in a sense, once somebody's got a prize for work that they've done, what incentive do they have to do any more work? Obviously, Tony is going to set up his nice little home office and a computer and uh, is going to sort of obviously work away. But, for example, if Tony decided just to go gambling, there's not really much we could do about that. So, so prizes are wonderful. They honor a significant contribution to the field. But if you think in terms of the future, the outcome is, is um, questionable in a way. Another approach is a grant, and we've seen uh, the grants that we have with the uh, young, excuse me, young Researcher Awards. In that case, you have a pot of money, and the hope is, if all goes well, you'll get an equivalent sort of output back. Now, that's, that's great, and I guess one issue is how much money have you got to give. GBIF doesn't have a huge amount of money. Uh, the small sums of money we give, for example, to uh, MSc and PhD students, it can have a very big impact for them, given the scale of the funding. But if we're looking for big impact, a grant is kind of limited. So one approach to sort of tackle this problem is a challenge. Now, the idea behind a challenge is you have a pot of money, you have a, a prize money, and the hope of it works is that you actually get a greater sort of output than the actual pot of money you have to offer. The reason for that is you get lots of people wanting to engage with it. So every sort of team or individual that get, participates or put in some degree of effort, and the cumulative sort of total of that is probably going to exceed the amount of money you're offering. So the idea is that you get greater bang for the buck. Who uses challenges? Is this some sort of just a, a crazy crackpot notion that the science committee has dreamed up? Um, it's partly a crackpot notion, but we're not alone in doing this. It's become quite a popular means of people to sort of generate interest in a particular field and to encourage innovation. Uh, this is one example that I was involved in a few years ago. This is uh, the Elsevier Grand Challenge. They are a science publisher, a very well-known science publisher, and they wanted to sort of rethink how you would sort of display scientific articles. They could have asked people, but why would you spend time telling Elsevier what, what you want to do? So they dangled some money in front of the community and said, come up with some ideas, some tools, and we will give you a prize. Uh, government agencies are increasingly using this. This is a website called challenge.gov, and basically this is uh, American government agencies, in this case involved in health, who are saying, well, we have all this data about health, we have all these kind of questions we're interested in, we don't have the smartest people necessarily in our agency, we, you know, we have some smart people, we don't have everybody who's relevant to this, let's offer some prizes and see what the community can come up with. So the idea is to have a challenge. What might we expect from the challenge? Well, I'm hoping that we get a number of things out of this. So we might, for example, expect some, some new visualizations. There's lots of kind of interesting ways we can explore and visualize data. So to give you a sense of the kind of things that are happening, if you like, sort of outside the GBIF world, um, some of you may have seen this. This is uh, Global Forest Watch, which is a project that's um, between the University of Maryland and Google, the Google Earth Engine. What they've done is they've taken a decade's worth of Landsat imagery, classified uh, vegetation by whether it's a forest or not, and then color-coded it. Green is where there's a forest. Red is where the forest is gone over that time period. Blue is where this new forest appeared. And purple is where you get sort of changes. Now, this is the kind of slides a bit hard to see. I am red-green colorblind, so I can virtually see nothing on the slide. If you're not so afflicted, you should be able to see that up in the, the sort of top rightish bit up here. There's um, big chunks of red. Forest is gone over a 10-year period. Some bits of blue. Forest has appeared. 
and down here you've got very highly managed forests. So this is where people have cut down the forest and then replanted uh, it, and this is kind of you know very heavy agricultural use down here. So it's an amazing kind of visualization. You get this kind of 10-year snapshot of how forest cover is changing on planet Earth. <laughs> Now you could ask, you know, could we do similar things with GBIF data, or could we sort of add GBIF data to something like this? Because all this says is forest, yes, no, changed or not, which is, you know, amazing information. It doesn't tell us anything about what species or so on, and it's only over a 10-year time period, whereas GBIF data spans decades to centuries. So it may be that there's new kinds of visualizations we might come up with. It may be that there's an opportunity to introduce new kinds of types of data into the GBIF world. So there's an awful lot of genomics data coming out, and a lot of that genomics data we can also put on a map. So anybody who's dealing with DNA barcodes or anybody who has any interest in microbial uh, distributions is going to be dealing with sequences and evolutionary trees. So perhaps we might sort of inspire new kinds of novel types of data to, to be applied to the kind of questions we're interested in. And lastly, there might be stuff we just simply haven't thought of, and that's one of the reasons for having a challenge. Because the idea behind the challenge is you actually, in a sense, want the kind of slightly left of center sort of bizarre kind of ideas to come forward. Because you're sort of going to flush some ideas out of the woodwork. We are, you know, a room full of smart people, but there's only, you know, so much we can do. There might be things we haven't thought of that other people have thought of. So if we get generally bizarre and interesting entries, I'm all for that. How does it work? Just sort of very briefly. So... What I sort of envisage is that the first time we're going to do this, the first challenge, the topic will be essentially open. We're looking for innovative uses of GBIF mobilized data. Um, if the challenge is successful, then future challenges could be more specific. You could imagine a specific uh, challenge targeted around um, data quality, taxonomic names, um, uh, relating it to particular kind of conservation priorities and so on. So I think the first time we want to do it, we want to keep it as open as possible so we encourage as much participation and then we could focus it on things that we could regard as being more important at that time. Uh, who can take part? The, the idea is it's open to anybody. Uh, obviously exceptions, if you work for GBIF in, in the Secretariat, um, no. If you're a member of the Science Committee like me, no. Um, but it could be open to individuals, teams, and companies. Um, if Google and Microsoft got, inter got interested, that would be great. There's also quite a growing ecosystem of small companies involved now in biodiversity and conservation who also might come up with some really interesting kind of possibilities. Why can't the Science Committee take part? Well, here's our, our Science Committee. Most of them looking very, very happy, apart from Mark. He's probably very disappointed he's not here. Or he's just discovered he's been renominated to be vice chair of the science committee. Either way, he's not happy. So the, these are the judges, and also the ex officio members of the science committee also can't take part. So these will be the people judging the entries. What we envisage is that there will be um, two rounds. So there'll be an initial round where we'd screen the initial proposals. We'd come up with, say, five semi finalists. They would be invited to tweak and improve their entries, and we'd then have a final round of judging. Why would anybody want to take part in this wonderful challenge, apart from the prestige of Jeebus' name? It's because there are prizes. So essentially what we've done is taken the money, the equivalent pot of money that we've used for the Ibn Nelson Prize, and divided it up into smaller, into smaller prizes. So for example, we're still sort of tweaking the details of this, but one scenario would be uh, the first round, the semi-finalists, we would have a small little financial incentive, 1,000 euros for each person who makes it to that level. So this would make it enticing, hopefully, to, you know, 1,000 euros is not much if you're a company, but if you're a student, it's a significant amount of money. If you are one of those five semi-finalists, you go forward to round two, where we would decide the final winner, up for 20,000 euros, and second place of 5,000 euros. This uh, final round of judging would take place at the near-mythical uh, GB22. Um, so that's the kind of um, the thing that we have in mind. We're just essentially sort of finalizing the details. When is it going to happen? Real soon now. Um, as soon as we've sort of finalized the details and uh, got an announcement out, the challenge will be open. So I hope this is going to be seen as a way to continue the legacy of the Edwin Nelson Prize in a slightly different kind of form, that it's a way to expand the um, audience for GBIF mediated data and the kind of things we do, and, and hopefully gratefully benefit GBIF in terms of attracting new and interesting kind of um, submissions and visualizations. So that's what I wanted to say about that. Um, I appreciate people may have some questions. Um, if anybody has a really burning question, we could deal with it. Otherwise, tomorrow morning, 
Um, I'll give a presentation about the, all the activities of the Science Committee, and we could talk about it in some detail then. Excellent. Thank you very much for your time.